This segment focuses on the topic of free radical halogenation at the allylic position. And first off, a reminder of what we're referring to when we talk about the allylic position. We're referring to the situation where we have a radical that is able to form and separated by a single bond from a carbon-carbon double bond. So what I've highlighted there in yellow on the right would be an example of an allylic radical. Just as in the left-hand structure, what I'm highlighting in yellow, that dot representing our free radical electron on the carbon, separated by a single bond from a carbon-carbon double bond, is also at the allylic position. The allylic position is relevant as a spot that's very favorable for the formation of a radical because of the fact that that radical can be shared over two different carbon atoms. So if we look at the two resonance structures shown here, and we see those single-headed electron pushing arrows in red, illustrating that we can take that radical electron, we can move that over to make a movement of the pi bond, and we can move the electrons from the original pi bond on the end. We can move one of those electrons over to the carbon at the very end of the molecule to create a second resonance structure. So this enables the radical to be shared over two atoms, and therefore those two atoms are only carrying part of the burden of having that radical present on them. And that's going to create a very stable reaction intermediate. And if we think about the relative stabilities of the different radicals that we can talk about, we're going to see that allylic radicals are going to be the most stable, more stable than a tertiary carbon alkyl radical, more stable than a secondary carbon alkyl radical, and more stable than a primary carbon alkyl radical. And the reason that allylic carb carbon radicals are the most stable type is because of the fact that they're going to be stabilized by resonance, allowing that radical to be fully shared over two different carbon atoms, much like what we see up here. We see that the radical character is shared over two carbon atoms through resonance. And resonance is a really strong factor that is able to stabilize molecules by sharing formal charges or sharing radicals over multiple atoms. On the other hand, the tertiary carbon radical of an alkyl group, such as what we see here, is stabilized only by induction, because by induction, we see that the three CH3 groups, which I'm gonna write in here in red, those three CH3 groups are each electron donating by induction, where that induction is the ability of bonds to become polarized, to either donate electrons, push electrons toward the rest of the molecule, or withdraw electrons from the rest of the molecule. In the case of alkyl groups, alkyl groups are electron donating by induction. So they're going to be pushing electron density away from themselves and toward that carbon radical. And the carbon radical is electron deficient. And so that electron deficient location in the molecule, the carbon radical, is going to be stabilized by having electron donation from those three alkyl groups. On the other hand, at the secondary carbon radical, we have only two alkyl groups to donate electrons to that carbon radical, and so that carbon radical is going to be less stable by induction. A primary carbon radical, if we fill in our carbon atoms here, our alkyl groups here, we would see that there's only one carbon directly bonded to the carbon radical, and therefore the induction electron donation is lowest, and therefore a primary carbon radical is the least stable. So when we think about and compare, the rates at which we would expect an allylic radical to form relative to a tertiary carbon radical and secondary and primary, we expect that the allylic radical will form most readily. And this is an important point that we're gonna look at today as we talk about reactions at the allylic position, specifically free radical halogenation reactions at the allylic position. These reactions are gonna draw some parallels to the halogenation reactions that we looked at of alkanes, where we were preferentially halogenating at tertiary carbons rather than secondary and primary carbons because of the increased stability of a tertiary carbon radical relative to a secondary radical or primary radical, we're going to see here that we're going to be doing a mechanism very similar to the free radical halogenation of alkanes reaction, except that we're going to be creating a radical intermediate at the allylic position because that's the most stable position of the molecule to create that radical. So let's dive in and take a look at the reaction of free radical halogenation at the allylic position and do the mechanism for this reaction. So we're going to start with a molecule called 1-propene. And this molecule 
is an alkene, hence it ends in an E-N-E suffix. And the molecular formula for this is CH2 double bonded to a CH and bonded to a CH3 group. So we're going to take that and react it with chlorine, Cl2. And it's very common that these reactions are run in a solvent such as CH2Cl2, which is dichloromethane. So don't let that throw you off if you see something like this showing up as one of the starting materials. What you can expect here is that this is your solvent in the reaction. So it's just the soup in which the reaction is taking place. And as we saw with the free radical halogenation of alkanes, we need light and heat present. So we're going to go ahead and plug in the light and heat there as well. So what's going to happen in this reaction to get things started, we're going to walk through the mechanism here. And just like what we saw in the free radical halogenation of alkanes, the first step is what we classify as an initiation step. This is what's going to get the ball rolling for the whole reaction to take place. So in the initiation step, completely identically to the initiation step for free radical halogenation of alkanes, we are going to take the Cl2 molecule and we're going to homolytically break the bond between the two chlorine atoms. So I'm drawing out my Cl2, show my light and heat there because this is the step of the reaction at which light and heat are required. And that light and heat are going to provide the energy required to break this chlorine-chlorine bond. One of the two electrons is going to go onto the chlorine on the right. One of the two electrons from that covalent bond is going to go to the chlorine on the left. We designate that with the single-headed arrow mapping out where the electrons end up at by the end of this step. So this is going to yield for us two chlorine radicals. We'll use two CLs. And I'm going to make sure that I show that unpaired electron over here to illustrate that this is indeed a radical. And remember that radicals are relatively unstable species. They aren't something we want to leave around at the very end of the reaction. They're present as intermediates. And so what's going to happen is that this chlorine radical, due to the fact that it's relatively unstable, in other words, it's relatively high in energy, it's eager to find something else in the reaction mixture to, to react with. As it looks around the reaction mixture, what it's going to be statistically most likely to interact with is going to be the alkene molecule. So in the second step of the reaction, which we'll classify as a propagation step, what's going to happen is that the chlorine radical is going to break a carbon-hydrogen bond at the position that will lead to the most stable carbon radical intermediate. So this is very analogous to what we were looking at when we were going through the reactions of alkanes with halogens was that in the second step of the mechanism, the propagation step, the chlorine radical or bromine radical came in and it broke a carbon hydrogen bond at the position that would lead to the most stable radical carbon intermediate. In the case of the alkanes, the most stable intermediate was the tertiary carbon radical. Here, the most stable intermediate is going to be a radical at the allylic position. So let's make sure we can pick out which is the allylic position. The allylic position is what's separated by a single bond from our alkene group. So if we take a look at our center of the universe here being the carbon-carbon double bond, we look for carbon atoms that are separated by that with a single bond. And we find that we have this CH3 group right here. I've drawn one of those carbon-hydrogen bonds out explicitly because that's what we're going to be showing participating in the reaction here. So we just have a CH3 group there on the lower right-hand side, and I'm going to be reacting one of those hydrogens, so I've shown it explicitly. So that's the allylic position. This is the allylic carbon. And that's what we're going to focus on for purposes of removing a hydrogen there, because when we remove a hydrogen at the allylic position, we're going to end up creating a resonance stabilized intermediate. Resonance is an excellent factor in stabilizing molecules. And so it's going to create a relatively stable intermediate. So we bring our chlorine radical over, single headed arrow, and we want to have it team up with one other electron to make a covalent bond. So we show our other electron coming in from that carbon-hydrogen bond. So that's going to create HCl by joining up the chlorine with the hydrogen. And then we have one additional electron that is in that carbon-hydrogen bond, and that has to go somewhere. Where it's going to go is up onto the carbon right up here. So I use, again, a single-headed arrow to denote the movement of one electron up onto that carbon. So now we have a CH2 radical there at this end of the molecule. 
and that CH2 radical at this end of the molecule is able to form because of the fact that it's stabilized by residence. It itself is a primary carbon radical. Primary carbon radicals are generally very unstable if they're alkyl ra radicals, but here, since it's allylic, it can be stabilized by resonance. So what we're gonna show here next up is our products resulting from this step of the mechanism. So we generate HCl, and we also generate our resonance stabilized allylic radical. So I'm gonna fill in my atoms here. So we have our CH2, and there's a radical electron on that, which I'm gonna fill in in green, since green was the color we were using for the electron pushing arrow there. And then do keep in mind that you need to consider resonance here because the two resonance structures may lead to two different possible products of this reaction. So we need to draw out our resonance structure here. So we'll take the unpaired electron from here, move it over one spot to start making a pi bond there. We take one electron from the pi bond over here, move it over to complete creation of a pi bond there at this right end of the molecule. And then we have one electron left in the pi bond here. So we're gonna move that over onto the carbon right here. And a pro tip for drawing resonance structures at the allylic position, any resonance structure that you draw should maintain the fact that the radical is always going to stay allylic to the carbon-carbon double bond. So the net effect of moving the carbon-carbon double bond and moving the radical is that the radical will always stay at an allylic position. It'll just move from one allylic spot to another in the molecule. So we've gone ahead and created our second resonance structure here. And now what we need to do at step three of our mechanism, getting us toward our monohalogenated product, is we're gonna do another step that we would classify as propagation. And in this propagation step, what we're going to do is we're gonna take that carbon radical, even though it's stabilized by resonance, it's still not stable enough to persist for very long at all. It's eager to react, and it's going to react with whatever the first reactant it comes in contact with that's able to, to participate in a reaction with it. And what's statistically most likely for that carbon radical to come into contact with is going to be another Cl2 molecule in this container of millions and millions of alkene molecules and millions and millions of chlorine molecules. So we're gonna take each of those two resonance structures and we're going to illustrate the reaction of each of those with Cl2. So I'm just redrawing my two resonance structures from up top. And we're gonna see whether these two resonance structures in this case lead to two separate products or not. This is always something you wanna check for. In some cases, they will lead to the same products at the end. In other cases, they'll lead to two constitutional isomer products at the end. So we wanna make sure that we've dotted all our I's and crossed all our T's here, meaning that we've looked at all the possible products that we would expect to form from this reaction. All right, so we've created our two carbon radicals. And now what we're going to do is React each of those with our Cl2 because this is what's going to be most abundant in the vessel that these reactants are present in, at least at the onset here. Okay, so now what we'll do is we will take our carbon radical, which is really hungry to react. It's very unstable. And remember that that chlorine-chlorine bond is the weakest bond within the system at the initiation step. We were able to break it with light and heat. So certainly this carbon radical is able to come in and force the breakage of that chlorine-chlorine bond. So we show the two single-headed arrows coming together to indicate the formation of a covalent bond between the carbon radical and the chlorine, where that covalent bond is formed using one electron from the carbon radical and one electron from the CL-CL covalent bond. The other electron from that bond goes on to the chlorine atom on the right here. So we're again using single-headed arrows to represent that. And then we're gonna use our reaction forward arrow here. And we'll go ahead and draw out our product that results from that. So this is going to be what we call our monohalogenated reaction product because it has incorporated one halogen atom into it. And so here we're gonna have CH2 and then I can just put CH2 Cl. We would also generate as a result of this step chlorine radical and I'm gonna put the radical electron here in bright green for emphasis. Similarly, we come down below and we're gonna do the same process with our second resonance structure. With our second resonance structure, we show the unpaired electron, the radical, 
coming over. It's going to team up with one of the two electrons from the chlorine-chlorine covalent bond. The other electron is going to go onto the chlorine. And voila, we're ready to write out the monohalogenated product that results from this resonance structure. So this is going to give us, at the left-hand end of this molecule, ClCH2. And additionally, we're going to put in our covalent bond here, do our carbon, carbon-carbon double bond, CH2. And if you're super comfortable with writing these out as line angle formulas, you can certainly do that for now. I've been showing all of the atoms in these structures just to make sure that we're not leaving anything out and help us keep track of where our electrons are coming and going. So now at this point, we have to ask ourselves: are the two monohalogenated products that we've created the same or are they two different constitutional isomers? So to address that question, what we can do is we can look at the longest carbon chain in the molecule. We can number it consistently for both of these and ask ourselves if the branches coming off, specifically the chlorine branch and the location of the carbon-carbon double bond, have changed in going from one structure to the other. If they have, that means we've created two different constitutional isomers and we should draw these both as our response. If these two structures turn out to be the same, then we only need to draw one of them. We don't want to draw the same structure twice. So let's go ahead and do that. I'm just going to find the longest carbon chain here and number it. I'm going to begin at the end closer to the alkene group. I'm going to call that carbon number one, carbon number two, carbon number three. So our alkene group is between carbons one and two, and our chlorine group is at carbon number three. We're going to come up here and do the same thing. Carbon number one is the alkene group. That's the same as what we saw at carbon number one of the other structure. Carbon number two is the same as what we saw in the other structure. It's directly bonded to an H, it's directly bonded to CH2Cl, and it's directly bonded to that CH2 group by a double bond. Come onward to carbon number three. Carbon number three is directly bonded to a CH2Cl. And so these two structures are identical. And due to the fact that they are identical, when we report our final answer, we just need to report one of these two structures since they just represent rotated, mo rotated molecules that are identical. We've drawn them out differently, but they are the same constitutional isomer. So these two are the same, so just draw one of these two structures. Now, just like was the case with free radical halogenation of alkanes, this reaction ultimately, once most of the Cl2 and most of the alkene have been used, will result in termination after the propagation steps have essentially exhausted themselves. And looking at those propagation steps, remember that the chlorine radical right here that we form as a result of step three of the mechanism, that chlorine radical is really reactive. And so what it can do, and the reason we call steps two and three propagation is it can come back in and react with an additional alkene molecule. After it's reacted with the alkene molecule, we'll come down here to give a radical at the allylic position, and then we create our products here, and the cycle begins again. So the propagation steps can cycle through from step two to three, and back to two over and over and over again, and that's why we only need the initiation step of forming the radical initially to happen once, and then the propagation steps will repeat over and over and over again until we've exhausted most of the Cl2 and most of the alkene that are present in the reaction mixture. Then what happens is we go on to the termination step, and in the termination step, what's going to happen is that this will represent any situation where two radicals manage to find each other. Because when the two radicals manage to find each other and react with one another, there will be no more radical and therefore there can be no more reaction. So examples of possible termination steps would be if we had two chlorine radicals that found one another. And this is generally only going to be favorable in situations where we have a limited amount of alkene left. Otherwise, it's going to be statistically more favorable for the chlorine radical to instead find the alkene in the reaction mixture. But if we have two chlorine radicals, those can join up to make Cl2. We can also have a situation where a chlorine radical finds one of our carbon radicals, our allylic radicals. And we could show that's happening like so as a termination step here. So chlorine radical comes over, 
forms a bond to the carbon radical and that's going to result in the creation of a halogenated product here. Like so. And we would also have the possible situation of bringing together two of these allylic carbon radicals and joining those two together to make a new carbon-carbon bond as another example of a termination step. Normally when we're thinking in practical terms of what we're interested in as the major organic product of the reaction, we're typically talking there about what the monohalogenation product would be of the propagation step three up there. So what I've circled there in the red box toward the top right hand of your screen is what we would predict as the major product of this reaction. And typically when we're looking at organic reactions, we're most interested in what the major product is. So if you're reporting the major product, you're gonna report what is shown there in the red box. Now, in addition to using Cl2 and Br2 for purposes of this allylic free radical halogenation, there is another reagent that is commonly used for allylic halogenation, and that's called n bromosuccinamide or NBS for short. So we're gonna look now at allylic halogenation using NBS. So a little halogenation with N bromo succinamide. And the structure of N bromo succinamide, or NBS for short, because that is rather a long word. So N for N, which means nitrogen, B for bromo, S for succinamide. The structure of this is a five membered ring with a nitrogen as one of the five atoms of the ring. That nitrogen is bonded to a bromine and adjacent to that nitrogen on both sides, you'll find carbonyl groups. And the purpose of NBS is that the bond between nitrogen and bromine right here can be homolytically broken to yield bromine radical. So what is going to happen is when you place this in a source of light and heat, it's going to enable the generation of bromine radical. And that bromine radical can participate in free radical halogenation reactions, just as we saw bromine radical or chlorine radical participating in free radical halogenation reactions with Cl2 and Br2. The advantage of n bromosuccinamide is it tends to be easier to handle than Cl2 or Br2. With Cl2 or Br2, you would have to have a cylinder of gas, chlorine gas and bromine gas, we certainly recognize as being toxic gases. And bromosuccinamide is not a gas, and so it's easier to handle and easier to work with in chemical reactions. So let's t do an example of working with n bromosuccinamide as our reactant. So we're gonna take for this example problem a starting alkene molecule. And we're gonna show that our reactants are NBS with light and heat. And we're gonna ask what the major product or products are of this reaction. Specifically, we're gonna focus on the major organic monohalogenation products. So in order to answer this question, what we have to keep in mind is when we think back to the reaction mechanism up here. We don't necessarily need to try to write, write out the whole mechanism for the reaction, but we need to keep in mind where we're going to form carbon radicals because it's going to be at the location where we form carbon radicals here that is going to lead to the major product because wherever you form the carbon radical is going to be where the halogen ultimately ends up. So we need to ask ourselves in this to take a shortcut on the mechanism so we don't have to write out a mechanism every single time we do reactions of free radical halogenation. We need to ask ourselves what's going to be the structure or structures of the radical intermediates. So what is the structure of the radical carbon that we would expect to form in these types of mechanisms? And this would be a good chance for you to hit pause and make sure that you can draw out what, where you would expect the radical to form on one of these carbon atoms. So we're gonna do that right now. Drawing out our structure here, we expect the radical to form at the allylic position. The allylic position hopefully recognizes this carbon atom right here. That's the carbon that's separated by a single bond from an alkene group. And so I'm gonna go ahead and put a dot 
right here to represent this is where the radical is going to form. And remember the lilac radicals, they're tricky little beasts because of the fact that they can undergo resonance. So we're going to share that radical over to here and bring one of the two pi electrons over to here. So we're moving both of the two different electrons over to make a new pi bond. The other electron from this pi bond here on the right has to come over to the very end of the molecule. And we're going to draw out this second resonance structure. Remember the hint I gave you a little bit ago about when you're drawing resonance structures at the allylic position, when you do the second resonance structure, it should still retain having the allylic radical present there. So we still got our radical at the allylic position here, single bond, followed by a double bond, just like we had over here. Now in this case, these two radicals will go ahead and draw the products that would result from those, that is the monohalogenation products, because the trend we saw in the mechanisms that we've looked at so far is that wherever it is that we form the carbon radical is where we're going to place the halogen atom in the final product. So this is a little bit of a shortcut rather than trying to write out a whole mechanism every single time. We predicted what the radical intermediates would be, and then we plug in the halogen atom at that location. So our halogen atom is going to go right here, and we were using n bromo 6 enamides, so we're going to put a bromine there. And our other product, coming over to the resonance structure on the right and just redrawing that, and replacing the radical with a bond to bromine. We'll go ahead and plug in that bromine bond there as a line with a bromine at the end gives us two different products for this reaction. And we can tell those are two different constitutional isomer products because if we go in and we say number the longest carbon chain, I'm going to start at the end closer to the alkene, one, two, three, four, five, we see that the bromine branch of the product on the left is at carbon number three. If we go and do the same thing for the structure on the right, I'm going to number my longest carbon chain. I'll go ahead and start at the end closer to the alkene group. Carbon number one, two, three, four, five, you'll see that the carbon-carbon double bond in that structure is between carbon two and three, and the bromine is at carbon number one. So these are definitely two different constitutional isomers. They have the same number and type of atom, but they definitely have a different connectivity between the atoms. So that's going to make these two our major organic products of this reaction that I've circled there in pink, and they are two different constitutional isomers. So with that, we'll conclude our discussion of allylic free radical halogenation.